lovely to have you here on this wonderful Friday morning. And great to see so many people showing up to learn about Childhood TV. Um, we have a packed, packed program. Ethel is just quickly loading up her talk. She was supposed to be first, but what we're going to do is quickly switch the first and second talk. So we're going to ask Tony to speak first. Um, what we are going to do is be quite strict on timing in the interest of um, giving later speakers uh, plenty of time. So I'm going to wave frantically at about 12 minutes and then we'll cut you off at 14. But that gives us a bit of time um, for questions and stuff. So, Tony, whenever you are ready, please take and the floor. And Simon is going to introduce himself and Tony. I hope this thing works. Yeah, seems like it. Um, I'm Simon Scarf. Um, I work for the Desmond Tutu TV Centre and at Stellenbosch University. And Tony is the director of our pharmacokinetic uh, unit at um, Stellenbosch University um, and Brooklyn Chess Hospital. And um, he's going to talk on the pharmacokinetics of moxifloxacin and the nasalate in children. Yeah, thanks very much, Simon, and good morning to everyone. Thanks for being here at this session. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose related to this presentation. So the optimal dosing of many second-line TB medications in children really has been poorly characterized and is essentially unknown. The current approach to establishing the optimal dose is to find the dose in children across, across weights and ages that results in drug exposures that approximate the exposures that are seen in adults who are receiving the currently recommended efficacious doses. Um, in order to do that, we need pharmacokinetic data in children with TB across ages for the relevant medications. Moxie and linazolid are critical medications currently in uh, MDR-TB treatment regimens. So Moxie is a very potent fluoroquinolone. It's really been the fluoroquinolone of choice, at least for adults. And um, importantly, it's a component of the newly recommended WHO 9 to 12 month shortened regimen. Linazolid is critically important for the treatment of XDR-TB. And also in, in the new WHO guidance is now a category C medication. Both medications are included in multiple novel regimens that are under evaluation in adults. And um, notably, yes, yesterday evening, the TB Alliance presented data, very exciting about some regimens that they have. Um, disseminated some early data that looked very promising for shortening treatment for both drug-susceptible and drug-resistant TB. Both moxie and linazolid are important components of those regimens that they're developing. So pediatric dosing is urgently needed to inform current care. Um, current dosing guidelines are, have not been updated in some time. But they're also needed for, to inform the design of future trials and to ensure access to novel regimens for children. So Moxie's a fluoroquinolone is only available as a 400 milligram unscored tablet. This is a problem for dosing, particularly in young children, is limited our ability to actually generate PK data and safety data in young children. In the course of this study, we use an extemporaneous suspension to dose in uh, young children and generate some data there. Um, Moxie has good oral bioavailability. It's metabolized partly in the liver and is excreted unchanged in the stool and urine partly. The target uh, is the AUC in adults after the currently recommended dose, so 400 milligrams in this case. And the WHO recommended dose is 7.5 to 10 milligrams per kg once daily for children. This is informed by very little actual data, so the only published PK data on Moxie is in 23 children aged 7 to 14 years of age with MDR-TB, which our group published a couple years ago. Um, and those children are actually included in this analysis, but there's no data in young children. <clears throat> Linazolid is an oxazolidinone antibiotic. Uh, it is available as a 600 milligram tab and also as a 20 milligram per mil suspension. It also has good oral bioavailability, um, complex metabolism with both renal and non-renal elimination. The target um, that we are looking at is the AUC in adults after the 600 milligram once daily oral dose, which is the most commonly used dose um, for TB treatment. The, the pediatric dose uh, being used in practice is 10 milligram per kg per dose twice daily for those less than 10 and once daily for those greater than 10 years of age. Um, there is pediatric PK data for children with non-TB infections like gram positives, but there's no data in, in children with TB. And actually, there's little rationale for that uh, pediatric dose that's being used in practice for TB. So the objective of the work I'm presenting today was to characterize the PK of moxie and linazolid in children routinely treated for probable or confirmed MDR-TB. And this data is from two studies. These are NIH, uh, NICHD-funded studies, MDR-PK1 and 2. They're being implemented in Cape Town, South Africa. 
Both studies include HIV-infected and uninfected children routinely treated for MDR-TB. You can see the age ranges there, 0 to 14 years for MDR-PK1, and then up to 17 years for MDR-PK2. The dosing differed slightly between the studies, so in MDR-PK1, the MOXIE dose was 7.5 to 10 milligrams per kg uh, once daily. MDR-PK2, we used modeled weight-banded doses that were close to about 10 milligrams per kg. Linaeslid, we follow the, the uh, dosing guidance that I presented earlier. Because linaeslid is quite expensive and is uh, essentially reserved for MDR and X, or XDR and pre-XDR TB in our context, not that many children are routinely receiving it. So in MDR-PK2, some children who weren't on it routinely received a single dose on the day of PK sampling so that we could generate some data. The sampling schema differed slightly between the two studies um, with a less intensive schedule in MDR-PK2. Assays were performed at the University of Cape Town, and uh, Rada Savage from UCSF did this analysis using nonlinear mixed effects modeling. So 52 children contributed PK data um, to this analysis. The majority were from the MDR-PK1 study. The median age was 8.4. 23 of the 52 were less than 7, so this is the first PK data in young children and nine of those 23 were actually less than two years of age. Just under half were male, 14% were HIV infected, and 14% had a weight for AIDS less than negative two. Just under half received the MOXI whole tablet. Um, a small proportion couldn't swallow the whole tablet and took the tablet crushed. We started using the extemporaneous preparation later in MDRPK1 in the MDRPK2 study. So um, I haven't presented sort of the detailed modeling output, partly because I don't want anyone to ask me any questions about it, and partly uh, because I wanted this to be clinically relevant and for people to be able to contextualize the results. Um, so in the model, um, allometric scaling on clearance and volume um, improved the model fit and were included in the final model. This is a way just to account for the, the influence of weight on these parameters. Um, HIV also increased clearance, and this was um, significant in um, in the final model. And then children with a low H, uh, height for age Z score also had an increased clearance and this was also included in the final model. So looking at the observed um, concentrations and exposures in this cohort compared to published adult values, in the bottom row you can see for Cmax, the published adult median Cmax um, after a 400 milligram dose is 4.7. And you can see not much difference across the ages in our cohort anywhere from two and a half to three, but definitely below what's seen in adults. Looking at the median AUC, um, this is in an adult cohort from Cape Town. Um, that was 38.7 after a 400 milligram adult dose. If you look just above that row at the 10 to 15 year cohort, you can see that the AUC actually quite nicely approximates what's seen in adults, uh, but as the age goes down, um, the exposures are well below target levels. And I think it's important just to note that that value of 38.7 is actually at the low end of what's been published for median exposures after 400 milligram dose. Just visually to show the AUC versus age, um, age is on the x-axis, MOXIE AUC on the y. The green hash line is the median MOXIE AUC from the publication I just mentioned, just under 40. Um, the, the solid red line are the median values in our cohort, and you can see around 12 years of age the, the AUCs actually quite nicely approximate adult exposures, but fall quite dramatically and are well below target levels in younger children. Moving on to some Linaesla data, so 17 children contributed data. 41% um, were from the MDRPK1 study. The median age was 4.8 years. Just over half were male. Only one child was HIV infected in this cohort, and two had a weight for age Z score less than negative two. Um, again, the, uh, no specifics about the, the sort of the modeling output, but allometric scaling on clearance and volume was included in the final model. Only 17 children were included, so we didn't really have a, a large enough sample to, to explore the impact of covariates um, or really to stratify by age in, in looking at the exposures. Um, but to see what was uh, looking at the observed exposures in these children, um, compared to published adult values. So the median Cmax um, in the entire cohort was 10.1, which is below what is seen in adults or published in adults, um, which is 14.9. Um, the median AUC, and this is for the dosing interval, so really after a single dose um, in, the, in, the, in our pediatric cohort was 97.7, which nicely approximates what's seen in adults, um, 96.8 after a 600 milligram 
oral dose. Um, I think this, there's a lot of detail and important detail that this sort of breezes over. Um, if you, so the, the reason for giving the dose twice daily in younger children is because they clear the drug more rapidly. Um, so the intent is to increase the AUC um, by giving the, the drug twice. Um, I think what we are seeing is that actually the 10 milligram per kg twice daily dose actually results in exposures that are um, well above what we're actually seeing in adults uh, for some of the, the weight bands. Um, and I think we need to look at that a, a bit more closely and um, it's poten there's the potential that actually we could reduce the dose that we're giving um, compared to sort of the practicing approach. So to summarize some key points and maybe some next steps, um, moxie, phylloxacin exposures were low in children after a 10 milligram per kg dose, uh, much lower in younger children relative to older children, and this is really the first um, data that we've seen in children with, with TB at younger ages. The next steps really are to take this model um, and to simulate optimal dosing across weight bands, so to establish dosing at each weight band that would approximate the adult exposures after a 400 milligram dose. Um, that would have to be obviously done carefully if we're, it would result in increased dosing at younger age groups in particular. Um, and so we've been carefully collecting safety data in these cohorts and we're in the process of analyze, analyzing that and um, any decision about increasing dose would need to look carefully and consider safety issues. From, from our perspective, we're actually more concerned about neuro CNS toxicity from the quinolones than, than we are about musculoskeletal concerns. We've been doing ECGs throughout these cohorts, um, and we will look carefully at, is there clinically significant QT prolongation? Um, but because we also have the concentration data and the PK model, we'll be able to look at relationships between QT prolongation and drug concentration, which um, I think will be useful going forward. I, we do need to explore a little bit more this um, increased clearance that we've seen with HIV infection. This hasn't been previously described. We think it's related to antiretrovirals rather than HIV itself, but all the children in our cohorts um, were on antiretrovirals, so we need to look at that a little bit more closely. Um, there's much more work, I think, to do for linazolid. Um, the linazolid exposures at least were adequate with the current dosing strategy. It's likely that our proposed or the, the strategy in practice of giving twice daily to younger children may actually result in higher exposures than are necessary, and I think there's a lot of scope to improve our dosing, um, particularly because we know the adverse events are dose and duration related. Um, so that may make linazolid much safer. Um, so our next step is to do some simulated optimal dosing and generate some weight-banded dosing that could be utilized in the field. We need larger numbers, and, and the MDRPK2 study is still enrolling. 30 out of 100 children have enrolled, and so we're continuing to generate um, additional data um, so that we can also look at the impact of covariates as well. And then, of course, safety is criti critically important concern for linazolid, and um, we're care carefully looking at the safety. Um, anecdotally, we have seen um, some cytopenias, um, particularly anemia, that have resolved relatively quickly with either dose reduction or stopping the medication. Um, we have not seen much neuropathy that we've been able to identify or at least aware of. I'd like to acknowledge all the funders and partners and the team who helped um, implement these studies, and particularly the patients and caregivers who were very generous to participate in these observational studies. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tony, and specifically for sticking to time. So we have time for one or two questions. Can I just quickly ask everyone to shift towards the corners, slide your bums across to the edges so we have uh, no uh, gaps in seats, no uh, bags on seats. There are lots of people at the back wanting to sit down. So if people could really all shift across to the walls, um, that would make space around. Thank you very much. And any questions? There's a question here. Do it's we a, have a microphone? Do we have a roaming microphone? At the back? Um, just shout out for now if you can, or use the microphone. They're coming. That's coming. Thank you for speakers. I'm Dr. Song from Korea, Seoul, Korea. I signed uh, International Tuberculosis Research Associations, Research Center, sorry. I'm very interested in the, your Rinazolid PK studies. As usual, as 
all of you know that we have a longitudinal study of urinary lead in clinical set and multi center. And I also regard to PK in adult dose 600. So somewhere in the world, maybe Cape Cod, um, I'm not sure the NIH creep value will be uh, regard to the, the study. In case of children, 300 milligrams is uh, very <coughs> recommended the dose of instead of 600 milligram. Do you have any figure of, about that? So your question is about whether 300 milligram dose might be more appropriate in children. <laughs> um, I think it, it speaks to the question of um, what is the optimal adult, adult dose um, of linazolid. And I think it's clear that we actually don't know and what the optimal adult dose of linazolid is in TB. I think we will actually, in the next, in the coming years, have some more information. I think um, TB Alliance is planning some work looking at multiple different dosing strategies. They um, have an EBA study comparing um, different dosings. So I think we will have some additional information. Um, you know, there's been some interesting sort of creative work to try and find better ways to to find targets for pediatric dosing, but I think at least currently uh, our best approach, um, or at least the approach with the most rationale and, and um, experience is to target adult concentration. So um, I think we need good information about that. We need to establish doses across all weights and ages that approximate those adult targets, um, keeping safety in mind, and I think that's the best approach. So um, hopefully our intent is that we'll have weight-banded dosing that would come out of this that's rational based on the model and based on the pharmacokinetics. Okay, I think one more, one question, maybe the last question. Hi, Tony, thank okay. you very much, very nice talk. I, I'm afraid I, I missed like to the beginning, so maybe you mentioned it. Uh, do you know in terms of moxin nazolid, uh, what is the association with toxicity, C-max or AUC, or both? Um, so, so for moxie, I think it, uh, at least for QT prolongation, which is a concern, um, it's likely to be C-max, whatever the concentration is. So at least the Cmaxes we were seeing were not in a range that we would expect to be problematic. And we have to obviously look at that carefully if we're gonna increase the dose. And, and what's really not well described is, is there a difference between adults and children in how, how their QT varies with drug concentration? So we'll actually be able to look at that. We can combine that into a PKPD model and actually project with these concentrations, these doses, what might we expect the QT to look like? How dangerous or problematic might that be? For other, for other adverse events like neurotoxicity, um, I don't think it's very clear what the PK tox relationships are for Moxy. For linazolid, um, I don't know that it's entirely clear as well. There's some very uh, recently published data suggesting that it's time over MIC that's associated um, with toxicity. And um, I think they did some looking back at the trial in South Korea that trough levels over 0.2 were associated with toxicities regardless of what the dose was. So people were getting 300 or 600 if they had a trough over 0.2, they're at an increased risk for toxicity. So I think there'll be, with the EBA study, with some additional work coming through, we'll know a lot more where we can actually have some more rational basis to think about safety in kids. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't introduce myself before. My name's James Seddon. I'm um, a pediatric doctor at Imperial College in London, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ethel Weld, who's um, a paediatrician, adult doctor, ID doctor, clinical pharmacologist working at Johns Hopkins. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, the dome at the bottom is the dome back at our place at home. The dome at the right is the dome um, here at the Liver Building in Liverpool. And I think we should get a bird for our dome. We can look into that. Um, <coughs> so I, I'm here in my capacity as co-chair of um, the IMPACT 2005 study, along with Tony Garcia Prats and Kelly Dooley. And this is a fa phase one and two open label single arm study to evaluate the PK safety and tolerability of delaminate in combination with OBR um, for MDRTB in children with uh, MDRTB with and without HIV co infection. Um, so I'm going to talk through our thought process as we crafted the protocol, which is now teetering on the brink of version 1.0. Um, and uh, basically, what I'm talking about is our rationale for studying an injectable sparing regimen in children. 
Um, so the WHO guidance everyone here is familiar with, and I'm aware that every paper I'm going to quote has uh, probably a collection of co-authors present in the room. Um, but uh, the, the guidelines uh, recommend that a standard regimen for MDR-TB in adults and children contain five drugs, pyrazinamide plus four core second-line drugs, of which one should be an injectable. But in children with mild forms of disease, recommend sparing the injectable. Um, this does not include children with culture-confirmed tuberculosis. Um, and just this week, there was new interim policy recommendations from the WHO based on Atsuka ongoing trials 232 and 233 um, and a case series of delaminid compassionate use in children that delaminid may be added to the WHO recommended longer regimen in children, not the shorter MDR-TB regimen. And this is children 6 to 17 years old. This was with very low confidence in estimates of effect and with all the usual conditions. Um, so the, these are the te central tenets of my argument, and the first is that injectables commonly cause severe, often irreversible toxicities in children. Um, so the ototoxicity of the injectables has been uh, well documented. Um, as you can see, the curve, the graph on the left shows gentamicin concentration in the organ of cordy and the lateral cochlear wall tissues of a rat. Uh, with various gentamicin dosing schedules, with the top line being daily dosing IM. And you can see from the flatness of that line that it's an extremely long half-life of elimination. It's actually 35 uh, days. Um, and the authors say um, that this yields an almost permanent sequestration of the drug. A bit hyperbolic, but uh, close to the truth. Um, at the bottom right is cytochocleograms depicting the death of hair cells um, in black, seen on histology in rats given these gentamicin dosing schedules. The left is the daily dosing, and you can see the black is bad, and it's um, through all three of the outer hair cell layers and uh, into the inner hair cell. And remember that sensory cells of the cochlea do not regenerate, either in children or in adults. Um, it's also been elegantly shown that uh, the AUC of amikacin in perilymph fluid correlates with the AUC in plasma and does seem to predict ototoxicity in guinea pigs. So you can see that in a not very dosing rate dependent fashion on the left, the uh, ratio of the level of amikacin in perilymph to the ratio uh, of the level in plasma is about the same, um, about 0 0.5, 7, 0 0.58. Um, and you can see in the middle, uh, the middle column here, um, the total dose of 1.09 grams shows the AUCs that were achieved with various dosing rates, and that is the threshold of ototoxicity in a guinea pig. The right-hand column is the total dose of 1.63 grams, which is achieving much higher AUCs. And you can see that a sigmoid relationship on the right is described between the percentage of animals uh, exhibiting ototoxicity and both the total dose and the total AUC of amikacin. And this is a refresher on perilymph and endolymph, which I needed, but it's basically been documented that aminoglycosides enter the hair cells via perilymph, and there's been a couple speculated paths of their entry. Um, moving on to children, uh, injectables do commonly cause severe, often irreversible toxicities in children. We have to keep in mind these are given uh, over prolonged periods, a median of four months, with an AUC much higher than if they were given over a month. The ototoxicity uh, has been docu documented to occur in greater than 25% of children given injectables for these long regimens and is often irreversible. It significantly affects neurocognitive development, uh, psychosocial functioning, school performance, and the ability for developing brains to learn language. There's speech and language comorbidities, and it's a programmatic challenge to monitor for this. Uh, audiom audiometry is expensive, uh, and this sort of hearing loss can develop before it is perceived in the high frequency ranges. Um, and it's, it's uh, important to mention that the IM injections are a profound source of physical and emotional suffering for both children and their caregivers. The contribution of injectables to standard MDR-TB treatment efficacy is in fact unclear. You can see that in vitro, um, on the upper right, there's a graph of the MIC and, and minimum bactericidal concentration for various tuberculosis drugs. You can see that amikacin is weakly bactericidal with an MBC slightly greater than in the MIC. Canamycin is bacteriostatic. In terms of early bacterial, bactericidal activity, amikacin at doses of 5 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day 
has no early bactericidal activity, as documented in the red box. You can see that it has the EBA that no drug has, whereas isoniazid performs the positive control worked. It's not that the assay, assay wasn't working, it was that the drug wasn't working to take down the number of CFUs in two days. The clinical outcomes of injectables are seen here. In adults, there have been large individual patient data uh, meta-analyses, one including 9,153 patients on the use of canamycin, amikacin, and capriamycin versus no injectable, and found that it was not associated with a successful treatment outcome. This was limited by the small number of patients who did not receive an injectable, most did. Um, there have been meta-analyses also, um, one of about 8,500 patients, which showed treatment success in 64% of patients with MDRTB, 56% of patients with MDRTB who had additional resistance to injectables. So that's a slight difference, but um, most patients who had additional resistance to injectables also had resist resistance to other second-line agents. So it was difficult to tease out, a real challenge to tease out how much the individual injectable was adding. In a meta-analysis at the bottom, in 337 patients, baseline quinolone resistance was associated with a fourfold higher odds of unfavorable outcome, but baseline resistance to injectable agents was not associated with a higher risk of unfavorable outcome. And in children, in a recently completed IPD meta-analysis of 842 children, 119 children were treated without injectables of those those with culture-confirmed MDRTB, 71.9% had a successful outcome. Of the children with probable MDRTB, 93.5% had a successful outcome. Adding a new drug with proven sterilizing activity to MDRTB regimens should improve outcomes significantly. Delaminid is a first-in-class nitroimidazole for MDRTB, which has been uh, EMA-approved um, WHO guidance, as mentioned. It is bactericidal, it has potent sterilizing activity, and it has strong EBA. You can see in the upper right-hand graph the early bactericidal activity of various doses of delaminid. And the figure in the lower right is the result from the randomized controlled trial of delaminid versus placebo plus OBR of uh, 481 adults, which showed a higher two-month culture conversion, 45.4%, uh, in the delaminid group versus 29.6% in the placebo, which was significant. Um, there was a continued observational study which showed um, lower mortality in those who received a larger number of months with delaminid. Um, you can see that the QT effect, which has been worried about, uh, given that some QT impact was seen in adults, uh, does not seem to be uh, present in children. Um, there's been, in the trial 232 and 233, there's been no incidence of um, QT greater than 480 milliseconds, uh, and there's been no change in QT from baseline of greater than 60 seconds. There's also been very good safety. Um, so this is from the WHO Interim Policy Guidance, the use of delaminid in the treatment of MDRTB in children and adolescents. And you can see that children from 6 to 11 years old received a slightly lower uh, MIG per kg dose, uh, depending on their age group, but achieved similar exposures in both CMAX and AUC of metabolite and drug to adults. So adding a new drug with proven sterilizing activity to an MDRTB regimen should improve outcomes significantly. And we have our, as our example, bedaquiline, which uh, has high cure rates in patients with TB resistant to injectables uh, who have pre-XDR and XDRTB, protominid, another nitromidazole, which is a high potency um, sterilizer uh, seen in patients with uh, drug sensitive TB in combination with moxie and pyrazinamide. Um, basically, the ability of an effective alter uh, the availability of an effective alternative does somewhat alter the risk-benefit calculus for injectables, especially in children. And it's important to note that um, in uh, 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 the prof's article that's quoted below, importantly, if a core drug cannot be used because of documented resistance or toxicity, it should be replaced by another with a similar, similar efficacy, bactericidal and sterilizing. And finally, children typically have posse bacillary disease, so they generally are easier to treat than adults. Posse bacillary disease, which is considered about 10 to the 5th bacilli as, as compared to the 10 to the 7th or 10 to the 8th seen in, in uh, smear positive um, patients, in theory does not require as many drugs to kill it. So from a bacteriologically purist point of view, um, that, is, that is true. Uh, children are also less likely to have cavitary disease. Um, many have extra pulmonary disease at the very young ages. 
Um, but it's important to note also that treatment failure and relapse are uncommon in children with MDR-TB. The ethical rationale for substitution of delaminate for the injectable and pediatric MDR-TB regimens must be paid attention to. Um, there's a duty to res reduce the already substantial burdens of suffering for pediatric patients. They're suffering under disease-related burdens, and it, there's a duty to minimize treatment-related burdens if we can, um, and replace the injectable with an equally or more effective agent, which minimizes disease-related burdens. So it's a priority of justice to ameliorate clusters of disadvantage that start in childhood, otherwise they become entrenched for an entire life. Um, now, guidelines are guidelines, but uh, chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken, and we don't want to become like the woman who cuts off the end of her Christmas ham, and her husband asks her why she's doing it, and she says, because my mother always did it, and she goes back to her mother and asks why her mother did it, and her mother said, because my pan was too small. We need to have ra a strong rationale for everything that we do. Thank you very much. Acknowledgements. We have time for one question. We have we will have some time afterwards. Two questions. No questions. This is my son uh, who uh, Kelly's holding. He was one month old. <laughs> <laughs> and her son. Yes, Jen. Yeah, that's a, it's a brilliant question, and we actually struggled as we were crafting this protocol with whether we would want our own children to be randomized to the arm that had an injectable in it. And it was a harder argument to make two years ago than it is now, and even at the MDR-TB trials landscape meeting two months ago, when we started gearing up to make this argument about eliminating the injectable, there was no one in the room who thought that we should study an arm that had an injectable in it. Um, so I think in practice this is being done. Uh, as you see in the WHO recommendations, um, mild disease, uh, meaning not bacteriologically confirmed, uh, is fine to treat without injectables. I think it is creeping into practice appropriately. Uh, the gears of progress are slow and sometimes not very coordinated, um, and sometimes the people on the front lines um, who are facing the caregivers and children with the adverse effects are, are the ones who can sometimes push that forward. Guidelines being guidelines, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sylvia Chang, who um, is based out of Brown and is going to be discussing some work she was doing in Peru. Can we? Good morning. On behalf of a large group of co-investigators from the U.S. and Peru, I'd like to present the results of one of our studies. It's a retrospective cohort study of children and adolescents with MDR-TB in Peru. And we had multiple different goals for this study, but what I'm presenting to you this morning are the results of our first analyses, which um, looked at baseline predictors of treatment outcomes in this cohort. Is this the left hand one or the right hand one? Backwards. I have no conflicts of interest. So the study setting is Lima, Peru. And in Lima, the TB incidence is about 200 per 100,000 per year. The HIV burden is low in comparison to settings where most of the MDR literature in children has come from. There's only a 0.3% incidence among adults, and among TB patients, only 6% prevalence of co-infection. So in Peru, 5% of new cases are MDR, and 20% of retreatment cases are MDR. In the country, the overall treatment success rate is about the same as the global treatment success rate, 55%. And MDR treatment in Peru is individualized to the patient's DST result, and in the case of children, um, most likely their source case is DST result, and it is ambulatory unless there's some obvious reason for hospitalization. 
So all patients in Peru who are treated with a second-line agent for any reason have extensive medical records stored at the NTP headquarters in Lima. So from this repository of charts, we selected out patients who are 0 to 15 years of age at the start of their treatment between 2005 and 2009, so they started treatment between those years, and they were treated in metropolitan Lima, and we excluded the rest of the country because uh, very incomplete records. And we included children who had either confirmed MDRTB or probable MDRTB. We used for our study the consensus definitions from the Sentinel project, and for those of you who are not familiar, the confirmed MDRTB means that you have MTB detected from a sample, and you have genotypic or phenotypic confirmation of resistance to at least isoniazid or rifampin. Or probable MDRTB means that you have clinically diagnosed TB and confirmed MDRTB in an identified source case. <laughs> so um, we had a wealth of data available to us, and we extracted hundreds of data points for each subject. Um, we did this at the NTP headquarters, and because of this a ton of data, we implemented several quality control measures, including duplicate chart abstraction. Um, what we wanted to look at in, for this particular analysis were what risk factors predict poor outcomes, and especially are there any modifiable risk factors that we can do something about to prevent poor outcomes in patients. So we looked at patient-related factors. Um, we defined baseline <laughs> patient-related factors as those that were measured prior to or within seven days of the initiation of treatment. Um, we looked at a number of things, including demographics. We looked at anthropometrics. We looked at anemia, whether or not they already had an MDR source case identified, because actually in one of um, James's studies in South Africa, this was identified as a risk factor. Um, routine laboratory and microbiologic results, whether they had confirmed versus probable MDR, and the disease severity as defined by the Wiseman criteria. We also looked at treatment-related variables, and in this particular analysis, we looked at only the first month of treatment, excluding any drugs received for less than a month. We looked at the number of likely affected drugs, not total drugs, but the likely affected drugs based on DST results, and we looked at the use of likely effective pyrazidamide, injectable agent, moxifloxacin, and ethionamide. Um, and we chose those particular components of therapy because, as previously mentioned, um, they have been found in adult studies to be associated with tr better outcomes. So we use regression to look at the associations between the independent variables and two outcomes. The first outcome was a composite of death and treatment failure, and we compared those children who died or <laughs> failed treatment with children who achieved cure or probable cure trouble cure, meaning that you never had a positive smear culture in the first place. We also compared children who were lost to follow-up versus children with any known outcome. So in the univariable uh, regression, we took those variables that were significant, and we put those in the multivariable analysis, but because we actually didn't have that many poor outcomes, we used stepwise regression to select the variables for the multivariable analysis. But we did include age in all of the final models because of its very strong association with treatment outcomes in many previous studies. And because we excluded patients with unknown outcomes from both of these analyses, we used Fisher's exact test to assess for bias, and we did not find any significant differences between the two groups. So in total, we reviewed 372 charts of patients who fit our age criteria and time criteria who were treated with second-line drugs. And after excluding patients who were duplicate patients, those who did not start treatment, those who were treated outside metropolitan Lima, as I mentioned, those patients had a lot of missing data from their charts. Um, and those patients who did not have either confirmed or probable MDR, we ended up with 232 patients in our final sample, about half and half confirmed and probable. So just a little bit about the cohort, just a little bit over half female. Most of the children, which is interesting, most of the children were actually adolescents, 57% between 10 and 15 years old, only 20% in the lowest age group, 28% um, with a weight for HC score um, less than or greater to negative one, and I'll explain later why we use that one and not negative two. 7% previously treated for TB, 89% um, with an identified MDR source case, 34% were classified as severe disease, mainly based on whether they had expert pulmonary TB or severe chest X-ray findings. 
Um, 50% AFB smear positive, although 10% did not have a result recorded. 55% culture positive, although 22% no result reported. And we had only two patients with HIV infection and eight patients with XDRTB. So regimen. Um, at this time in Peru, in, in our cohort, 66% um, received greater than or equal to five drugs in this first month of therapy, 88% an injectable agent, 47% pyrazidamide, 43% ethionamide, and 22% moxifloxacin. At this time in Peru, most patients were still receiving ciprofloxacin. So overall, our cohort did quite well. We had 70% treatment success, cure or probable cure. We had 13% loss to follow-up, 8% um, treatment failure or death, and 9% unknown outcome. So unknown outcome being that we could not find a treatment outcome recorded in the chart. Now, um, when we did our univariable analysis, we had broken up our age group and weight for HD score into three different categories. For age group, we originally compared zero to four, 5 to 9 and 10 to 14, and what we found was that 10 to 15 was significantly different from the other two groups. So for multivariable, we simplified our groupings. And for weight to age C score, initially we had greater than negative 1, and these are based on WHO standards. So we initially had greater than negative 1, we had between negative 1 and negative 2, and less than <coughs> negative 2. And because the two lower categories um, were not significantly different from each other, but were significantly different from the highest category, we combine those two categories together. And that's why we have these categories for our multivariable analysis, and we did find associations in multivariable between a low weight for HZ score with death or treatment failure, and we found an association with disease severity with death and treatment failure. Now, unfortunately, we didn't find any predictive, um, any predictive factors for loss to follow up. So, what are the significance of these findings? Well, first of all, um, we're, our cohort um, is the largest outside of South Africa and in a low HIV setting with fully ambulatory treatment, so it does offer a little bit of geographic diversity, shows what happens to kids with MDR in other parts of the world. Um, consistent with previous studies, we actually show a pretty high treatment success rate in children, 77% among patients with known outcomes. So, Patients with severe disease had a higher risk of death or treatment failure. That seems pretty obvious. For me, there could be two clinical implications from this finding. First, um, the severe disease could reflect a number of things, including the pathogen virulence, the host response, and whether or not you had treatment delay. So obviously, these things would need to be teased out a little bit more, but basically, what our finding could reflect is that it is very, it just gives stronger evidence to show the importance of prompt treatment initiation. And the other thing uh, is a possible um, implication for treatment is that the Wiseman criteria may be useful for deciding which tr children may receive um, a more aggressive versus a less aggressive regimen. So we found that low weight for age was associated with poor treatment outcomes, and we found this after we adjusted for disease severity, and this was actually a similar finding to um, two cohorts from South Africa, one from KwaZulu-Natal and one from Cape Town, who also found similar things. And the mechanism is unknown. So we only had weight for age available. We didn't have complete data for weight for height or height for age. So a couple of things. One is that this, so this weight for age, we can't really tease out, is this acute malnutrition? Is this chronic malnutrition? Could this be um, correlating with micronutrient deficiencies? Um, is it that it's lean muscle or it's fat? If it's fat, you know, there's a lot of data that show leptin actually stimulates um, TH1 activity. So could that be a mechanism in which higher weight for age is protective? We don't know these things. It would be useful to tease them out to see if there is something modifiable to help improve patient outcomes. Whoops. We did not find any associations with regimen composition and treatment outcomes, but again, we only <laughs> looked at the first month. And we couldn't examine injectable agents because most of the patients received them. And high rate of loss to follow up. Again, we did not find any associations. However, our cohort, our data source, had limited social demographic information available to analyze. Um, one word about adolescence. So there was an association in the univariable analysis between 
being an adolescent and having a worse treatment outcome. And this association disappeared after we adjusted for disease severity. So to me, the way I interpret that is adolescents in our cohort did worse because they had more severe disease at baseline. So what does this mean? Could this mean that adolescents, maybe they presented later to care, so they had more severe disease prior to treatment initiation? <laughs> or is there some peripubertal transition in immunity where they are more likely to have the adult type disease? Um, nevertheless, what I just want to emphasize is that adolescents, this, what this finding reminds us is that adolescents are among the highest risk groups for TB, having uh, poor TB outcomes, as shown by previous studies by um, Petros and Jen, um, and especially adolescent MDR TB, and yet adolescent TB is still largely invisible. So a number of limitations to our study. As with any retrospective study, we had some missing data. Um, as I mentioned, um, we didn't find any associations with loss to follow-up and treatment outcome, but I think that if we did a prospective study and we looked at a more complete set of social demographic variables, we would probably find something. And our regimen analysis was limited in this case to the first month only, and we had to assume the same drug susceptibility pattern for the child as the identified source case, and there are inherent limitations in resistance testing. So future directions. As I mentioned, we didn't find anything with the first month of treatment outcomes, so now our next task is to do a detailed analysis of the entire treatment regimen. Um, we would like to identify early surrogates of final treatment outcome in adults. They use uh, you know, time to culture conversion, smear conversion, but in children, especially those who don't have smear or culture positivity in the first place, we don't really have anything comparable that we use regularly. Um, we would like to combine our adolescent data with an earlier adolescent cohort from Lima to try to tease out uh, what are risk factors that are specific in the adolescent age group for poor outcomes. And then um, potentially a prospective cohort study to clarify those predictors of loss to follow up and what are some of the different aspects of poor nutrition that could be modifiable that are related to treatment outcome and modifiable causes of disease severity as well. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge all my co-authors and um, the funders and other people who helped support our study. Okay, do we have any questions? So one question, right up. Um, hi, um, I'm Rada Savic, clinical pharmacologist from UCSF. Thank you so much. This is really wonderful. Um, I was wondering if you had actual doses that would minister to those children because, um, you know, clearly weight for age is being very important and it could be just that these, you know, light kids were actually consistently underdosed. Yes, um, we do have the doses and we are analyzing those right now. So we don't, I don't have results to tell you right now, but we do have that information that will come out. Any other questions? Maybe I could just ask a question. I was, I was just looking okay. at the numbers. Um, is there any reason why you have, actually, so a, a, a small number in the, in the very young age group, um, <clears throat> and also the, you showed that there was half the ch children were cults confirmed, but also half of them had smear positive disease, which doesn't really match this half 50% of the smear yeah. of the culture confirmed or is it 50% yeah. of the total group? So I think part of that has to do with um, <coughs> probably some missing data. I think I had only 10% missing a smear result, but 22% missing a culture result, if mm. I'm remembering correctly. So I think that that may explain some of it. Um, there was a time, a long time ago, it's no longer really believed in proof, but I heard this rumor, I'm not sure, because I wasn't um, working in proof at the time, that um, there was this belief that, oh, if it's smear negative, why send it for culture, it's smear negative? So it could be that mm -hmm. if there was smear negative, it was not even sent for culture. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, it is the, the yeah. fact the, that there were fewer the young few children. small uh, young children. Yeah, that, <coughs> that is definitely something that are, caught our attention mm -hmm. um, because there probably should be more. Yeah, one would expect in the 0 to 4 year old age group, a, a higher exactly. number. Exactly, exactly. That caller attention as well. Um, I don't really have an explanation. Potentially under diagnosis mm -hmm. would be my best, my best guess. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dennis Falson, who is a medical officer at, uh, in the global TB program at uh, WHO who's going to um, 
inform us about the new uh, MDR TV guidelines and its aspects to children. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much, Chairs. Um, so I think um, many of you are conversant with these guidelines and quite a number of the um, key features which relate to children have already been mentioned by the previous speaker. So I'll try to focus on other aspects that um, may be of relevance um, uh, concerning the process. Um, <clears throat> I have no conflict and the, um, the, the main highlights will be the, the changes since um, the May 2016 um, guidelines and something about the, the evidence. Um, you've probably seen this slide as well. Um, this is the latest update about the burden of um, TB in the world, so about 10.4 million incident cases, 1.8 million deaths, including the cases with HIV disease. About 1 million of these um, incident cases are in children, estimated, and globally <laughs> close to uh, 580,000 cases um, emerging who need MDR TB regimens um, in total. So. Um, substantial proportion of that will be um, children as well. Um, <clears throat> so guidelines for MDRTB have um, quite a long history with WHO going back to about 96, 97. Uh, in the last five years or so, we've been producing these guidelines according to the grade methodology, um, starting with this, um, the, the, the red one over here. And since then, we've had the um, pro, uh, pre, uh, inter interim guidelines <coughs> for um, for Bedaquiline 2013 and for um, Delamaya 2014. So there is a new one now, um, 2016. I didn't get the chance to, to update this slide because it came out <laughs> just a couple of days ago. And um, these are the guidelines about which um, I'll, I'll speak mostly. So um, without going into a lot of details, but um, the way that we update guidelines nowadays is a, um, a, a very lengthy process. Typically, for in this case, for instance, it took about one and a half years for the guidelines to come out. But it starts with a sort of prioritization of the questions to which we feel that um, um, answers are need to be given or there's highest demand and there wide kind of um, discussion amongst them, experts, both internal and external to WHO, about these, um, these requirements uh, or, or, or the, um, the real gaps that need to be answered. And after that, there is a sort of method of um, putting those um, questions into a formal uh, structure, in the PICO structure and then a search for the evidence. And finally, in this process, there is um, uh, a number of guideline groups and, and expert panels which are set up to draft the, um, assess the, the, the evidence, formulate the recommendations, give peer um, review, and then internal oversight um, uh, structures within WHO. And finally, we can um, release the, the, uh, the guidance. So um, quite a lengthy process. and. Very often, people are very kind of tired and even frustrated at the end of that assignment. Um, <coughs> okay, so um, the guidelines of WHO, uh, the, we have a, even a handbook to how to produce the guidelines, but um, I think there are some important things which, uh, yeah, despite that process being long and tiring, actually is a, it's really an attempt to make sure that um, all the evidence and all the um, elements of that exist are set out and, 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 and um, looked at in a way which minimizes bias, you know, and retains transparency so that anyone who reads the recommendation can go back and find why that had happened, okay? And we use this great method to assess both the certainty of the evidence and then move from the evidence um, and integrate into, with the evidence other considerations to come out with the best possible um, recommendation. So certainty of the evidence is one of the things that you will find a statement on um, within all of our recommendations. Uh, it goes from very low, which is uh, often the case uh, for uh, MDRTB, unfortunately, because uh, very often we have to depend on observational data. And uh, there are usually other factors which tend to pull down the quality of the data even lower than, than what would wash or want. <coughs> High quality um, evidence is usually the preserve of RCTs, but even RCTs at times can be pulled down because of a number of things, such as imprecision, indirectness, and so on and so forth. Okay, another aspect of the recommendations is amongst the statement of the recommendation is whether they are strong or conditional, which means weaker, basically. But uh, I think it's an important thing to, to stop and think about because um, <coughs> We know now that um, even um, there is a signif statistically significant difference in the um, uptake of recommendations according to the, um, the strength. So strong recommendations certainly get more up, uh, taken up more frequently than others, although condition recommendations still 
get taken up. So it's not a, non, a negligible sort of proportion of the recommendations which, uh, which are conditional, which are not taken up. But I think the significance of this beyond the statistical significance of the implementation of these um, recommendations is what it means to the different either end, end users or the affected persons, uh, uh, the, the patients. So when it's a strong recommendation, usually it's a course of action that most people and most clinicians and policymakers feel that should be taken unless there are sort of um, other overriding um, um, issues or contraindications. While a conditional recommendation is taken from the, the word, it depends on a number of conditions and other uh, kind of mitigated circumstances which apply either to the patient or else at times within the circumstances of the program. So um, in the orange guidelines which came out in May, all the recommendations were conditional, okay, and all the certainty in the end was um, graded as a very low. Okay, these are the main changes which are summarized over here. So for, for the first time, we have an evidence-based recommendation to use this shorter um, MDRTB regimen, which is more or less um, uh, modeled upon the um, <coughs> Bangladesh regimen, which has been tried out in a number of other settings and for which evidence um, had become available. All of it, um, of course, uh, observational level at this stage. We, we hope to have RCT data in, in, in maybe just over one year, uh, <coughs> at least for, for adults. Um, also, there, there is a clear statement that all cases with rifampicin resistant TB, the, the patients who will be detected using um, techno leading technologies such as expert, um, would benefit from um, an MDR regimen. And it's not the case of trying to wait until you have a, an isoniazid susceptible result before you decide to put that patient on um, a full MDR uh, regimen, be it shorter or longer. Okay, so there is a change in the regrouping of the medicines made um, on the basis of um, uh, balance of, well, the evidence which was available. There are some RCT data now coming in as well, um, and also on balance of harms, potential harms and benefits. Um, <coughs> oops, sorry. Uh, we're lucky to have um, an individual patient um, uh, data set now for children with close to 1,000 um, records. Okay, which um, I think which was very important for us to be able to make more sort of um, uh, conclusive um, uh, recommendations for children, amongst which the one which has been mentioned about the um, uh, possibility to avoid injectables in children who don't have severe type of disease. And finally, there's also a recommendation on partial resection um, lung surgery. So, well, that's the full recommendation for the um, shorter regimen. Again, uh, condition recommendation, very low quality evidence, but essentially, um, the recommendation is applies to patients who have been, not been exposed to proquinones or second line injectables or preferably excluded by um, uh, reliable DST. Okay, so that is the standardized type of regimen that we recommend. Uh, many of you are by now aware of it. There was this also the release by the union about the um, one of the most important data sets that we used for uh, for to come up with these um, recommendations. But uh, it's a um, four to six month um, intensive phase, fixed um, continuation phase with five months with four drugs, seven drugs in the intensive phase, and very limited space for um, changes in the or, or adaptations to this regimen because it's a, one of the, th this, the strengths of it, if you want, is that it is a standardized regimen. So hopefully a bit easier to, um, to, to implement, to train people to use it, to um, uh, affect the drug orders. I mean, pertinent to this group is that it's um, applicable for children. It can be given to people with um, uh, with uh, HIV on fluoroquinolones. Okay. Um, <coughs> even though the recommendation is um, is now there, we still um, emphasize that there is an importance for close um, uh, monitoring of the patients, both for effectiveness because. I mean, certainly the, the experience with the use of this drug in, in patients now, we've used data from about 10 countries, okay? Many of them are in, in African or Asian settings, actually, all of them. Um, and, uh, but, uh, for instance, the experience of use of these regimens in children is still um, uh, very, very sparse, okay? It is um, uh, also uh, of interest to the programs that it lowers the cost. So uh, I think the overall drugs cost for an adult would be at around 500 to 700 dollars. Uh, drug costs alone, X, X works. Okay, an effect of the um, recommendations has also been this um, uh, regrouping. So fluoroquinolone, second line injectables, and group C are the ones which make up the sort of core regimen. Okay, 
there's a small change in the recommend in the recommendations for the uh, uh, there's no longer ofloxacin in the in the list of fluoroquinolones. Second line injectable is more or less the same. Streptomycin finds its way here in, in brackets. Okay, it's a, really a drug of last resort. Uh, if you if you want to still use an injectable and the others are cannot be used for one reason or the other. Um, the group for drugs, uh, which you remember in the past, um, consists of etionomide cyclosarin and PAS. PAS has been relegated down here. While linezolid clofazimine came up, we have now some RCT data, at least for these two drugs um, available. Otherwise, first-line drugs, okay, which um, parazimide is usually included with a with a, a longer regimen, and the others can be included as well, uh, and as well as the, um, uh, the 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 newer drugs. Okay, and these are the drugs where really you cannot, unless you cannot constitute a regimen with the rest. Um, you have to resort to. So actually, the recommendation <laughs> is here. OK, so usually you take one, one, um, at least two of these, OK, depending on effectiveness and pyrazinamide. Um, <clears throat> very often, if you lose confidence in one or more of these, you will need to increase either of these or else probably have to go um, to, the, uh, to the new drugs. OK, I'll skip over these quickly. I think most of the thing. We have said, um, <clears throat> so macrolides no longer feature there, okay, not even in the dust, uh, the, the waste bin kind of category at the very end. And um, uh, active TB drug safety monitoring, it's um, basically the use of pharmacovigilance or close uh, monitoring of adverse events in patients is recommended for patients with, um, on many of these regimens actually in effect, um, because uh, one, I, one of the, I think one of the important things to, to realize now is that the shorter regimen has become the regimen of first option, okay? So if the patient does not have, um, satisfy one of these criteria, um, then a longer regimen is proposed. So this, the proportion of patients who will be eligible for the shorter regimen will vary, of course, primarily depending on the uh, patterns of resistance, but also, okay. Um, but also other considerations, so for instance, extra pulmonary disease for now and pregnancy, um, they, they are exclusion criteria for the shorter regimen. Also, skipping back very quickly on this um, thing which I had highlighted, so um, I think we mentioned this, pedaquiline is still um, not yet included in policy. Hopefully we'll have more data in the coming year and we'll be able to look at this. I think it also the important thing um, moving forward is that we are looking now at data sets as well um, uh, to, to, uh, for uh, individual patient data sets for both MDR-TB and isoniazid resistant <laughs> TB to see whether there, is gr there are grounds to also change the recommendations on, on, on those. For instance, the duration of the longer regimen is not something that we have changed in these recommendations because there are no new elements to, to, um, to, to, uh, to use to, to be able to make those changes. But this morning we're hearing from, since from Dick Menzies that in the IPD that he had done up to 2009, there now with the updates, there are about, I think, 12,000 new records. So it's a very exciting development. And with isoniazid resistance, I think it's also, there's also much more data than we had hoped for. So I think there will be some interesting discussion about the um, com composition of, uh, of these regimes. Okay, so um, I think with that, I would like to just highlight where you can find the guidelines themselves. There are also, uh, they are on our, our <coughs> website since May, and we also have annexes where you can get the, a bit more detail about the evidence that was used. And finally, I'd like to thank a lot of people here um, who, who did all the work. Thanks very much. So we have one question. <coughs> yes, thank you. I'm Shashi Kalshwasa from Baylor Research Institute. I just have one comment. A regimen which lasts for nine to 12 months, can we call it a shorter regimen for children? Yeah, w w that's one of the reasons why we don't call it short, actually. It's short there, so <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's in relative terms. No, but seriously, I think, I think it's important to, to the, the, this, this distinction. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dan. It was a really useful update on the guidelines. We'll have some, we'll have some time more for questions after the last speaker.
Okay, and then our final speaker is Arvind Swaminathan, who is a paediatrician um, working in India, who spent a, a large amount of time working with MSF and most recently in Tajikistan on their drug-resistant TB project in children. Thank you, James. Uh, good morning, all of you. So the next few minutes, I'll be um, speaking about the challenges and solutions to scaling up uh, pediatric multidrug-resistant tuberculosis treatment in Central Asia. Um, I do have lots of interest in this presentation, but no conflicts of interest. So I was working for this uh, International Humanitarian Medical Organization, MSF, which all of you might be knowing. Uh, we work in about 70 countries all over the globe, uh, dealing with a wide variety of diseases, including tuberculosis, HIV, leishmaniasis, and others. So in Central Asia, we focus more on uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Um, my talk, uh, especially focusing on pediatric tuberculosis, would be more about the Tajik mission, because that was dedicated for a comprehensive pediatric tuberculosis program. Um, so in case some of you are interested in uh, uh, enjoying nature, Central Asia is probably the place you're waiting to uh, witness. And if there is something that's more beautiful than that, it's probably the children over there. Um, so the uh, pediatric DRTB in Central Asia, um, MSF started collaborating with the Ministry of Health in Tajikistan uh, in starting this comprehensive pediatric TB care program in 2011. So we did focus on DS and DRTB because they're uh, closely interconnected. And as you all uh, would already know, uh, adult tuberculosis is quite closely related to pediatric tuberculosis. So we did enroll the adult contacts of pediatric patients in our cohort as well. So the three components that we focused on were early and appropriate diagnosis, early and comprehensive treatment of these patients, and more importantly, adherent support for children and their families, which was quite essential, especially uh, with the age group of the population we were dealing with. So um, when we set out about this task, of course, we did realize that there would be a lot of challenges in front of us, so um, there would be a lot of brainstorming, and we'd uh, come up with a lot of solutions, and we think that it's all going to work in the field. And then we set out uh, the project, and uh, we, we think that we are going to proceed uh, in the right direction right away. But then what you end up getting is actually more challenges, um, as most of you would have already seen. Uh, so uh, conventional uh, ways of management may not be enough. Actually, we might need some uh, really good ideas. Uh, and just need to wait and see if they work in the field as well. So um, any solution would first begin with a systematic understanding of the challenges uh, that you are uh, anticipating. Uh, so the challenges that we stratified were case finding, um, diagnostic treatment, and health system, which I'll be speaking about um, one by one in the subsequent slides. Uh, so regarding case finding challenges, uh, of course it was probably one of the most formidable challenges, especially with uh, kids, uh, because there was a perception widely that uh, children do not generally acquire uh, severe resistances, so-called. Um, so it took a while to break that perception, and uh, active case finding was uh, launched, uh, and contact tracing, of course, uh, beginning from the adult MDRTB patients who were already on treatment. So we reached out to the patients in their homes, in their families, in their villages. And um, apart from finding out uh, more than uh, 1,400 contacts and uh, realizing that at least a few of them are active tuberculosis patients, one great advantage that we witnessed was that uh, it really helped to improve patient and uh, community awareness about this disease and dispel stigma and myths. Because when you go around screening uh, almost the entire village or a major proportion of the families around there, um, it, it sort of uh, brings down the stigma that is associated with this disease, uh, unfortunately. And as we all know, uh, tuberculosis patients, especially kids, do not necessarily land up with TB specialists. Because in Central Asia and the Russian Federation, uh, we do have uh, specialists who are uh, specifically meant for dealing with tuberculosis, the physiatrists. Uh, but unfortunately, or not all kids with TB would land up with these uh, specialists. They'd rather uh, visit their pediatrician or infectious disease specialist. So we uh, really required uh, good awareness among the doctors, first of all. And uh, we, need to, uh, we had to um, make sure that there was uh, established referral pathways for these uh, kids to reach the right place. So that's what we worked on um, in finding out the patients. Uh, and then the diagnostic challenges, as uh, uh, we've all been hearing for the last couple of days. So it's, uh, it's quite difficult to obtain uh, samples to prove uh, drug-resistant TB in kids. And sputum induction came in really handy in that aspect. So we set up the infrastructure. We uh, carried out uh, training uh, for human resources. And uh, we made sure the materials were available. So sputum induction is now being done uh, routinely uh, as uh, microbiological uh, documentation would be the gold standard in uh, recognizing tuberculosis, more so drug resistant. And gene expert facility was installed in pediatric tuberculosis hospital. Um, training was imparted to the staff in uh, utilizing these machines. And quality control was ensured. 
Uh, of course, uh, quality radiology adds uh, to the microbiological armamentarium in good diagnosis. Um, uh, that's me in the picture. I don't. I didn't mean myself by wood quality radiology services. <laughs> we did have a dedicated team of uh, experts in radiology, <laughs> whom we could contact through telemedicine. So that was just a representative picture. So coming to treatment, uh, we uh, made sure that HIV testing was made mandatory for all the TB patients, uh, drug sensitive or resistant, before uh, starting the TB treatment and conforming with the uh, WHO guidelines. And the empirical treatment was started. Uh, for all the kids, uh, without um, wasting the uh, golden time that uh, would um, otherwise have been spent in waiting for the detailed drug susceptibility testing. And of course, once we get the detailed DST results, we would in fact uh, modify the regimen according to the individual patient. Um, so one of the uh, greatest challenges when it comes to treatment was to make sure that the kids receive the exact dosage that they were supposed to receive. So unfortunately, many of the drugs, uh, especially the second-line drugs, uh, are not available in pediatric formulations. And at least uh, some of them in, uh, whose uh, syrup formulations were available in other countries were quite expensive to be imported and uh, implemented in these uh, Central Asian countries. So the uh, best locally adaptable, implementable solution turned out to be drug compounding, which is what we worked on. And uh, um, it, it again involved uh, evolving standard protocols, training uh, human power, and uh, getting this procedure uh, recognized by the local authorities. But uh, it was really useful, and uh, it did make a uh, significant difference, especially in terms <laughs> of providing medicines with good shelf life uh, during uh, winter, especially, where uh, many of these homes would be uh, not be so reachable on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, um, we have been hearing a lot about Bedaquil and Delaminid. Uh, MSF uh, was not left behind in catching up with this fever as well. Uh, so at present, we have four children on bedaquiline in Tajikistan cohort, all of them adolescents. Two of them have already completed 24 weeks. The other two have sputum converted. And uh, uh, very recently, two more children have been started on delaminate as well. So that's some good news, but there's still a long way to go. Um, and in Uzbekistan, where we have a much bigger mission, uh, we had already started a shortened nine-month MDRTB uh, regimen protocol where we initially started enrolling adults. And currently, uh, we do have 10 children in this cohort, five of whom have already uh, successfully completed their treatment, and uh, among the remaining five, two have already culture converted and doing well as well. So, of course, uh, treatment challenges included monitoring of adverse effects, which might be as trivial as a minor drug rash uh, or maybe as dangerous as a, a serious hepatotoxicity. So, a stringent monitoring uh, protocol and uh, a dedicated team of uh, people who could do this as well were necessary. This again involved uh, uh, an MSF team which used to travel to these people's homes at in uh, specified intervals to uh, perform these uh, tests. And uh, we did work in uh, liaison with the local uh, government authorities, the uh, peripheral health centers as well. Um, and as you can see, uh, it involved um, analyzing thyroid status and pure tone audiometry for hearing screening. Um, and yeah, so we did have uh, DRTB patients with other problems as well, uh, at least a couple of them with HIV positivity and at least one with type 1 diabetes. So it did involve significant efforts in integrating these resources. It was not an easy task, uh, considering uh, strict compartmentalization of health services in Central Asia. But um, we did work on a case-to-case -case basis, and uh, it is moving in the right direction, I would say. And uh, as WHO has recommended, uh, we have been working a lot on implementing ambulatory care, and there's been uh, significant progress in shortening the duration of hospitalization for these children. And right now, uh, in the initial part of the initiation phase, these kids are hospitalized, and once they uh, tolerate the drugs and once they are doing well, they, be, they are getting uh, discharged home, and uh, most part of the treatment is right now given as ambulatory care, which is really good. Uh, that uh, brings me to the next part of the uh, care for these kids in terms of uh, psychosocial, psychosocial health and uh, home-based education, which would be much better taken care of if these kids are at home. And uh, we did have a dedicated nutritional protocol um, to cater to the needs of these DRTB children based on their uh, weight uh, standards and uh, based on the calculation of uh, calories and proteins that they would require with that particular disease. So apart from doing all this, it was necessary to put all this into a document which would be uh, available to the practitioners in the country and which would make sense to them, um, and to get it recognized by the local national TB authorities. So that's what we did uh, in collaboration with the other actors and the national TB program. We put down the um, standard practices in the form of a guideline, and we got it registered by the national TB program. And um, uh, I'm happy to say that it's, uh, it's being followed in the country uh, right now. 
and uh, health system challenges um, cannot be tackled at, uh, at the level of any single organization. Uh, so it, it involves more multi-sectoral coordination, including the governmental authorities. So we did work a lot on uh, recording and reporting of uh, TB statistics, uh, ensuring um, uninterrupted financial support and uh, uninterrupted supply of drugs by working on logistics and supply chains as well. Uh, but again, I would say that this is still an ongoing effort and there's still a long way to go. Uh, so this was the end result. Uh, there have been total uh, 137 patients in Tajikistan cohort so far, um, 75 of whom have already achieved some outcomes, and fortunately 41 were cured and 19 completed the treatment successfully. And fortunately nine uh, children died and uh, five uh, failed treatment. One was transferred out of the pro uh, program. So among the um, uh, remaining uh, kids, most of them have been uh, doing good. Uh, many who are uh, culture positive have now culture uh, converted, and they've been doing well as well. Um, so if I were to um, depict by uh, WhatsApp emojis about what I felt when I started working with uh, TB Healthcare, it would seem something similar to this. Uh, so um, I thought probably I shouldn't be so nihilistic, uh, I shouldn't be so pessimistic, so probably I need to just hang for a while and things would change. And I was right, they did change, but unfortunately it got, got worse. <laughs> So uh, I think most of you would have had these experiences as well. So uh, there must be something, um, I mean, I, I thought to myself that there must be something that's really missing in this link, uh, because despite all these efforts that we have just discussed in the previous slides, uh, things move at a really slow pace. Uh, so we did work on uh, several other aspects, uh, looking out of the uh, medical aspect of TB care, uh, which uh, did involve understanding the local population and their language and their culture. Because as I figured out, um, working for people uh, turned out to be much less important than working with them. Um, so it, uh, it was really useful to un uh, try to understand their language and try to understand their problems from their perspective, sit down with them, work with them, uh, and see what solutions would work best for them. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, try to find out the solutions involving the local population, which included the doctors, the national TB program, the patients, including kids and their families. So I think that did make some substantial difference uh, in um, crossing the major hurdles that we had. And as I already said, it's uh, still an ongoing process. So I cannot claim that we have achieved miracles, but then um, uh, things are proceeding in the right direction. Uh, as uh, was uh, documented in this document, uh, best practices in prevention, control, and care of DRTB. Um, Tajikistan's uh, pediatric TB program uh, did receive its uh, recognition that it uh, deserved and uh, did give an encouragement uh, to be emulated in other resource poor settings. So with this uh, background, I think it is possible to change uh, the WhatsApp emoji. Uh, so as they say, uh, if the path is beautiful, ask where it leads to. But if the destination is beautiful, never mind about the path, just keep walking. I think that's what... Um, uh, I would suggest for pediatric TB programs to keep doing uh, rather than uh, worrying about the end. And uh, my special thanks to all my TB patients, especially the kids and their families and the wonderful staff members of MSF and MOH in Central Asia, and Philip, Jay, and James for all their uh, support. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Aravind. It's a lovely presentation. Really fascinating to see the challenges that are there in Central Asia. Have we got any questions? We've got a couple of minutes. So I think we can have questions specifically for Aravind, but um, also for the other speakers. We have uh, still a few minutes. And I think it would be interesting. This is an opportunity. A lot of people in this room are very interested and passionate about the treatment of drug-resistant TB in children. And this is a, a forum for us as a group to discuss how we should be treating children for drug-resistant TB globally. And um, it'd be useful to have any people's thoughts or suggestions on that. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, it does switch on. Sorry. Um, Ian Kedai from Sick Kids in Toronto. One, one thing that was raised, I think, very eloquently was the problem of amicacin and injectables. And, and there's certainly still some regimes in kids where they're going to continue. And one of the, the questions I always have as a clinician is, do we have any evidence about how we can use these as carefully as possible to try and minimize toxicity, or is toxicity just inevitable? And I just wondered with the experts if, uh, if there are some thoughts on that. Does anyone have a good response to that? I've got thoughts myself, but maybe Tony could talk about that. He, um... So 
So as I'm understanding the question, it was, can we use the injectables more responsibly to reduce toxicity? Is, is that correct? Um, I think there's a couple things. So uh, the, the most responsible use or way to use them to eliminate toxicity is to not use them. Um, so that has to be our goal, and it, has, it's not, it, it shouldn't be that far off the horizon. I think Ethel made a strong case that from a risk-benefit perspective for a lot of kids, they just shouldn't be used. Um, and, and that's not going to show up in some of the guidelines yet, but I think in the field that really has to be a strong consideration just because these are permanent, important um, adverse events for, for patients, for really disabling. Um, I, I, the exposure, the, the um, association between amikacin or injectables and hearing loss, it's really about cumulative exposure. So higher the dose, the longer you give it, the more likely you are to get um, hearing loss. Um, so there's the, really the best way is to reduce how much you use it. Um, the problem is that its efficacy is also related to its concentrations. Um, so that's where the problem is. Um, I think we really need to find creative ways to use some of the new drugs and other drugs. I think um, if you're in a situation where you're not able to screen for hearing loss early, that's a problem. Um, you should be looking regularly um, for hearing loss. If, because hearing loss can progress um, even when you identify it or even after you stop medications. Um, I think as soon as you identify it, you should really try and find a substituting agent and stop. Um, if you don't have the capacity to look, I think that shifts the risk-benefit ratio of using the injectables even more to the side of finding some other agent that you can substitute for them. Um, I think there's, and James could probably speak to potentially um, interesting possibilities of using um, anecdotes or um, other agents to sort of block the, the hearing loss. Maybe you can say something about that. Um, I'll just say something quickly, then there are a couple of other people who have things to I mean, I, I think that, um, I think it's a really interesting point. I think we need to think, what, what are we asking these drugs to do? Um, amicacin is not going to kill the bugs any quicker than the moxifloxin or levofloxin. So you're really, you, you are using it there to protect resistance development. And that needs to be there when there are lots of bacilli on the child. So do we need to be giving it for six months? I, I, it's an open question. Um, you know, maybe we do need to give it, but maybe only for a month or two. And, and this is something we need to be exploring. And then the other thing which, um, which Tony mentioned is, I think there is emerging evidence that there are other agents, antioxidant agents, n cysteine, aspirin, other agents that can be given alongside the injectables that, um, that reduce the risk of hearing loss. And I certainly, if I got MDR-TB and I was treated myself, I would go across the road to the chemist and over the counter without a prescription I'd buy some n cysteine, which you can get as a vitamin supplement and I would take that every day with my injectable. Um, if that's how I feel, should we not be prescribing that to our children? I don't, know. I don't think there's a great evidence base for it, but I, I would take it personally. Um, so those are, I think Tony's point is the best, let's stop using them. But I think if not, let's stop using them earlier and maybe explore in a search context um, other things. I don't know if someone has any thoughts. Yeah, I think um, many children with, with TB have low uh, facility loads and, and amication can be stopped earlier. Um, there is about, a th a th from our gr uh, patient group, about a third that we don't even start amication for one or other reason. And most of our children, we can actually stop amication four months after starting treatment. And we often, if, as soon as we see um, hearing loss developing, we switch uh, drugs and we usually switch to PAS, uh, which is relegated now to group D3, which I don't understand because, I, well, I understand it. It's because of the adults. It's not because of the children, because the children manage PAS much better than adults. And it's still a good drug. And I think it's relegated, unfortunately, for adults, but with that, it, it seems like it's not a good drug, but it is a good drug still, and probably as good as amication. And the question that one can ask, if, if we don't have the laminates for the younger kids, why not use PASS instead of uh, amication? Okay, there's a question or comment from Anna, and then we've got a question here, and then maybe one there if we've got time. A very quick question, and maybe comment. Uh, is there any evidence that capriamycin is better than amicacin? Because I know that some Eastern European colleagues prefer to use capriamycin because they've got uh, experience that it doesn't cause as much hearing loss, is the first one. The second question is about, sorry, but NAC. Uh, there is evidence of NAC, uh, you, you know, protective uh, uh, in terms of hearing loss with aminoglycosides, and there is meta-analysis published I think, in patients with renal failure. And is there is any evidence or experience of its use in children treated, treated for TB? Or published experience, no? 
because that's what would be nice, not just like, you know, uh, low personal There is a group of people who, should be, who should be doing these, who are doing these studies. So I think there's no evidence of NS, N-acetylcysteine in TB generally, let alone in children. Um, in terms of your other question, um, I looked at the evidence quite carefully in terms of the different drugs, injectables, and whether they are associated with different amounts of hearing loss. There's very little published, but what is published doesn't seem to suggest there is, but, but that doesn't mean it doesn't. There's an absence of evidence rather than e evidence for absence, so I think we need more studies to look at it. Okay, so there's a question here. Can I, can I just add to, amication is currently, the, in, in, in terms of MICs uh, for TB, um, uh, amication is the best uh, injectable drug. Um, and it is possible that it has slightly more uh, um, hearing loss, but you know, if you look at the at the MICs for amikacin, it's less than one. For ca for canamycin and capriomycin, it's about two to four. So it's still the best. Uh, Can I add something to the capriomycin? I think you're correct. There's an absence of evidence, although there seems to be this view that it is safer mm. from a hearing loss perspective. But what there is not a question about is that it. It does actually cause more renal issues, more um, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, so that certainly is an important consideration. Okay, just Okay, uh, first question was asked. Can you asked. tell us who you are? Okay, it's about uh, Caprio, but what about intermittent regimen? Four times a week or three times a week, mm -hmm. injectables for children? I think um, if you use the same cumulative dose, so the same dose in a week, um, that's divided, that doesn't look like it affects efficacy, but it will also not be safer from a hearing loss perspective. The cumulative exposure, if you use the same total dose in a week, will be the same whether you split it um, or given it daily. So I think the main thing is that that's probably just as efficacious and maybe better tolerated by patients because you're giving less injections, um, but it will not likely reduce the risk of hearing loss. So I think that's important to understand. Any other comments, thoughts? I'm a little nervous to ask a question because I'm, an, I'm not a pediatrician, but um, as I treat adults with MDRTB, I have a better um, comfort level knowing my fluoroquinolone dose is adequate. And when you're talking about small kids where it looks like your AUC is about half of what it would be in an adult, and then you're talking about ridding, a, ridding the injectable, that seems like it would be um, a, a little bit frightening if you had severe disease. I agree, like if we have adults with a whiff of disease, we're not too concerned about them either. But um, I don't know if you want to comment and, and what kind of dose do people really use? Do you use 10 mg per kg in a small child uh, of moxie if you know your AUC is inadequate? I think it's a really good question. What dose should I give my three-year-old? <laughs> yeah, so I think the, what didn't come out clearly in the presentation, but actually did, I think, come through in Sylvia's presentation is and some of James and Simon's cohorts as well, is that with the doses that we've been using, even though exposures are quite low, actually outcomes are really good. Um, even you know some of the PK work has overlapped with cohorts, and, and our outcomes in our cohorts that we reported PK data on are very good. Um, so and in, it includes kids who are culture confirmed who have severe disease. Um, and, and so certainly some additional caution is warranted um, and kids who have severe disease, but kids in general do quite, quite, quite well. So I think that is a take home point. Um, but increasingly it's becoming clear that low drug exposures are associated with outcome in drug susceptible TB and in drug resistant TB. So we can't be blase about it. And I think we do need to be careful about what we're doing, be thoughtful about our doses. Um, I, you know, everything is risk benefit and um, we don't have good data about safety of higher doses of quinolones. And I think we need some information um, in that regard. What also sort of didn't come out clearly uh, because we haven't done all the simulations, but if you push the exposures up with a once daily dose of moxifloxacin, and, and so in those young children, you wanna get them once daily moxi at a dose that approximates the adult exposures, you're gonna have Cmaxes that are actually well above what's seen in adults, and that's concerning, at least theoretically, from a toxicity um, perspective. And we have seen toxicity, and Simon could speak to that, um, in children who have received overdoses of quinolones. They've accidentally taken twice the dose. We've seen hallucinations, um, serious sleep disturbances. So, uh, and we've also seen other neuro-important toxicities. So I think there's, there's some more work to do here. Um, 
I think giving at a, at a dose of 10 milligrams per kg sort of as a minimum, as a, as a routine practice, people shouldn't be afraid to do that. Any other comments? Yes. So I'm not even a pediatrician, or not even a doctor. I'm a pharmacist. I'm working on stream trial. And uh, my question is to WHO. I think he disappeared. No, unfortunately, okay. <laughs> unfortunately, just left because of But my comment would be, so it is good to have a recommendations and new guidelines, but these medicines that are not on essential drug list, and it was like a long process to uh, publish the guidelines, so there was enough time to make a submission to essential drug list. Number one. Number two, um, it is also, at, at least in stream, we have a very big difficulties to, uh, to provide the recommended dose of moxifloxacin because the, the tablets are not scored. And again, these uh, tablets that are product that we are buying or, uh, are WHO approved or were, went through the pre-qualification process, where they could insist on the manufacturers, they have to put score so on the tablet so you can achieve 600 milligram dose that is recommended. I think these are great points, and I think we, we all need to be thinking yeah. about how we include formulations at an early, early stage in the whole process. But also the, the, the new regimen to, to give those in younger kids, we have a problem with clofazamine, which is only in gel caps of 50 or 100 milligrams. In our country, we only have 100 milligram uh, gel cap available. Uh, the moxifloxin only comes in a 400 milligram tablet, and actually, the, the, if I understand it correctly, uh, the, the moxie is a high dose moxie for the shorter regimen. Um, but yeah, it's not. It's like 800 milligram. It's not 400 milligram, and we're not even giving close to that. Um, and now we're using levo instead of moxie because we don't have the right dose. So I think there are a couple of things that we need to sort out uh, about this regimen. I think we're going to have to draw it to a close because I think this room's needed and also there are many other symposiums. But I would like to thank all the speakers and I'd like you to join me in thanking all the speakers for what's been a great session.